Hello, everyone. Today, um, we have the privilege of having with us theologian and professor Craig Keener. And I have invited him so that we can discuss the topic of end times or the end of the world, more specifically eschatology. And um, we'll be talking a little bit about all the views that Christians hold to, but more specifically to the view that um, Craig Keener holds to, and he believes that that is the one that is taught by scripture. And among other things, um, I, my hope is that this video will be something that people that have never heard about this topic in depth, that they will be able to follow along and get an overview on the topic and maybe at the end um, we can recommend some resources for you to go even deeper into the subject so thank you so much for joining us <laughs> And I would like to start by asking you to tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, the things that you do for the Lord. Sure. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> well, first of all, I love Jesus. I'm a Jesus follower. And when Jesus comes back, that's what will matter, not the and all the titles will be gone. So he's except King of Kings and Lord of Lords, his title. Mm -hmm. um, so whatever else we are for him in this world, it's an instrument for uh, what will be for him forever. But um, <clears throat> I was converted in my uh, mid teens as a result of some people witnessing on the street. I came from a non Christian background, uh, I was converted from atheism and started sharing Christ in the street. And then, but also because, I mean, the little kids in Sunday school knew more about the Bible than I did. I had to start cramming. So I found out if you read 40 chapters of the Bible a day, you can get through the Bible every month or through the New Testament every week. <clears throat> so I did that for a, a time while I was trying to learn the Bible better. And then also, well, eventually I started realizing, hmm, there are things that the Bible that the biblical authors take for granted that their audience knows. I mean, not least Greek and Hebrew, but, um, but that I didn't know. And so <clears throat> that's what aroused my interest in Bible background and eventually produced the, the Bible background commentary after, after I finished my PhD in New Testament um, at, at Duke University. Um, I've taught at a few different seminaries. Right now I'm teaching at Asbury Theological Seminary, um, teaching uh, PhD students and master's students. My wife, Medine, um, Medine Wasunga Keener, is from Congo, Brazzaville. Um, she was a refugee there for 18 months after she finished her PhD. And then um, <clears throat> our kind of suspended romance picked up after, after that. And um, uh, the book Impossible Love just talks about that. But uh, yeah, so. I guess that's all, that's the, that's the big stuff. Oh, and, and I have like 33 books, no, 34 books out and a bunch of articles. Yeah, I recently purchased three of them. <laughs> and I, I would love to get the one also of the story of you and your wife. I heard a little bit of that story in your recent, well, recent to me um, interview with Sean McDowell. Yeah. Um, and a little bit, I think you talk a little bit about it on in this book. Um, yeah. I think um, it's not afraid of the Antichrist, which you co-wrote with Dr. Brown, Michael Brown, which um, he's also someone else's ministry that I really love to follow. And then um, you mentioned the Bible background commentary. Are you talking about this one right here? Yes. Yeah. Okay. No, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. The first the first edition came out in 1993, okay. which tells you why I'm so old and why if I did have any hair, it would all be gray. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah um, I'm looking forward to reading this. I was talking to my daughter about it. She's 
seven years old and I was telling her, so if we have any questions about, you know, the Bible, we can just go here and read a little bit more about that. And, and um, so it doesn't, the, doesn't really answer all of them, but yeah, <laughs> well, it has a, more answers than what we have on our own. And um, this book, yeah. which I love, I'm loving uh, going into this topic recently um, because it affects me. It affects uh, my own views about even what I can share online and if I'm doing something wrong or not. So I really look forward to reading this. But um, I've already heard some of your videos on YouTube and it's, it's really helpful to hear the information, the arguments that sometimes you don't hear um, from the other side. Yeah. And um, so I have questions from people that um, maybe these questions could be a good way for us to um, see where people are at, people that do not attend seminary and you know struggle with the terminology. <clears throat> So um, I think it, I, I have about, I think about five questions that if you like, we could just, you could just answer them briefly and then kind of gauge how you could go more into depth um, about those topics later on with our other questions. So my, my first question comes actually from my, my seven year old daughter. And she's, she says, you know, children um, do ask these questions um, because, for example, when I am talking to my kids about, like, if someone passed away, a grandfather, and we talk about heaven, you know, and then so my kids, they have soaked up the whole, like, gospel. It's so clear in their mind, but they do ask me questions, and I'm like, Oh, I need to study on that. I don't know. I don't know how to explain about heaven and and when he's coming. So, like, kids, I have two questions from my two kids, just to kind of give people, maybe parents, an idea that you know, kids do have these questions, and maybe it's relevant for us to learn as parents so that we can better answer their questions. So, my daughter is asking, um, in her own child way, she's asking if. Jesus says that um, he's coming and we don't know when, how can we prepare? So I think she's imagining that like, we need to get ready to like be ready for when he's coming, you know? Do you know how you would answer a child in that, in a simple way? Yeah, preparing, well, not knowing when he's coming means we always need to be ready, but being ready just means we're following Jesus. So. Mm -hmm. Um, it means not acting like he's not coming, but really acting like, well, you know, someday he's going to come. And we want everything we do in this life to make a difference for forever. You know, we want it to count for forever. And, and so we're always looking for his coming and, and what that means. I mean, that's, I guess that's the way I would okay yeah and my son he's six years old he says in other words he's pretty much saying what's taking so long for jesus yeah. to come <laughs> yeah no that's a big question actually um and that one troubles a lot of people and actually in in the, already in the in the first century it was troubling some people like in second peter three it says that mockers will come saying mm. and i'm not saying that everybody asked the question as a mocker right. I mean, we've all probably asked the question but yeah. um mockers will come saying where's the promise of his coming everything's just stayed the same since the beginning of the world and peter mm -hmm. says well uh, don't 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 forget the flood <laughs> but he also um he goes on to say the lord is not slow concerning his promise but is patient toward us giving more people time to repent and so he's going to have a, a people from every kingdom and tribe and people and nation, Revelation says, um, Matthew 24, 14, when the good news of the kingdom has been preached among all the nations, then the end will come. Or Romans chapter 11, when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, then, then the Jewish people will turn to faith and 
and the Messiah, and um, yeah, and then also, yeah, there's just a lot of passages about, about that in terms of God's plan. Um, we're going to have lots and lots of brothers and sisters because, because of the, the delay. Uh, mm -hmm. God, God does know what he's doing. Mm -hmm. But also, um, from a perspective just in the first century, when it says, I'm coming soon, of course, you know, like uh, in the Chronicles of Narnia, Aslan says all times are soon. Uh, for, you know, I call all times soon. But, uh, and the day is like a thousand years, <clears throat> like, again, Second Peter, quoting, I think, Psalm 90 or so. But they, th this had been going on for like eight centuries already. So people were already used to it by the time you get to the New Testament. So, you know, Isaiah, other prophets uh, had, been, had been saying that the day of the Lord is at hand. In other words, <clears throat> imminence doesn't mean immediacy. Imminence means always be ready. And, you know, by the time you get to the first century, obviously, people should understand that because it's, it's been going on for a long time. And so certainly, you know, with already in the Bible, like eight centuries of preparation, we should, we should understand the same. But they're also, and I know, I know I'm going beyond the six-year-old answer at this point, but just because it's a, it's a question for, yeah. for a lot of us. Um, there are also phases in God's work. So, you know, the prophets talked about the restoration. You know, the people were, they, they went off into exile in, in Babylon. And um, in terms of coming back, well, that, that did start happening. Jeremiah talked about a 70 years prophecy. Well, you know, many of them came back, but then Daniel says, wait, this can't be the whole thing. And he said, okay, okay. for this, it's 70 Sabbaths or sabbatical years so it's like 490 years like oh <laughs> and then you get to the new testament and, and you find okay some things are being fulfilled some of the things the prophets talked about are being fulfilled right then mm. we're still waiting for the second coming and depending on whether you're depending on your view of the millennium the thousand year period in revelation 20 then there may be yet another phase before the full completion so god's patience allows some things to be fulfilled now but then some things are still, we're still waiting on some things. So um, the, in the Old Testament, God was prophesying of the end times already. And it was not just in reference to Jesus coming, like as the Messiah. Yeah, his first coming, his second coming. And there are also other things that were like part of the restoration when they returned from, when many of them returned from Babylon. But then, um, <clears throat> so it's like unfolding. It's, it's not all at once, it's unfolding. Mm -hmm. And so we've already seen some of that unfolding. So mm -hmm. we, we need to stop being so impatient. But no, <laughs> I, I mean, in a sense, we're supposed to be impatient in the sense like Paul uh, talks about uh, eagerly looking forward to, to Jesus' return. He even says that the Lord is eager, eagerly looking forward to it. Mm -hmm. And then Second Peter talks about looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. Mm -hmm. And I assume that the way we can hasten it is, is our role in terms of preaching the good news of the kingdom among all the nations, and then the end will come. So mm -hmm. um, as, as, we, as we carry out the message of the good news, we're, God is actually using us to have a, a, a place in that uh, larger plan. Would you happen to know if, um... For example, the Jew, Jewish believers, well, not believers, Jews that don't believe that Jesus was the Messiah, um, how, how is their view impacted when it comes to their es eschatology? <clears throat> well, there are different Jewish views today. Um, in, in Jesus' day, when they, when actually there were different Jewish views in Jesus' day too, I mean, the Sadducees didn't seem to they didn't believe in a future resurrection. I'm not even mm -hmm. sure they, I'm not even sure what they thought about a future day of the Lord. Mm -hmm. But, um, but the Pharisees and probably probably the majority of the Jewish population, Pharisees were a minority, but they held some of the more popular views. They believed that the kingdom was coming. When the king would come, the Messiah would come. Uh, that would also be the roughly the time of the resurrection of the dead and 
that, that, that would be the fulfillment of God's promises. So they kind of expected all the rest of the unfolding to happen all at once. They weren't expecting two comings of the Messiah and therefore two phases of the kingdom, uh, the king coming once and the king coming again, or the, or the Messiah being raised from the dead is the first fruits of the later resurrection of everybody else. Mm. Um, so the unfolding took them by surprise, or maybe surprise isn't the right word since they weren't, they mm -hmm. didn't believe, met, most of them didn't believe that it happened. I mean, some Pharisees became believers in Jesus, like, like uh, Saul of Tarsus, but in, the, in Acts 15, 5. Anyway, I'm, I'm digressing too much from your question. So, uh, um, so Jesus was revealing, in a sense, what the prophecies meant about um, eschatology, in a sense, because he was revealing that he, some of the prophecies were referring to him and, and his crucifixion. But the people that didn't believe in him, it made it like that much easier to not believe in him because they they rejected his interpretation of what he was saying what he was revealing about prophecies yeah <clears throat> and actually his what was going to happen to him was so counterintuitive from the perspectives of the day that he actually didn't go around talking about it directly he talks about the mystery about the kingdom you know, going back to to the book of Daniel, especially Daniel two, where it speaks of you know there are these four world empires, these four kingdoms, Babylon and, and so on. And then by his day, they thought of the fourth world empire as Rome, but in in that part of the world. Hmm. But then after that, um, there's this mystery. The secret of the kingdom is that after that, God's kingdom comes and overthrows all those earthly hmm. kingdoms. And then later in Daniel, it, it, it speaks of those four kingdoms as like four, in, in Daniel 7, as four beasts. Like they're, they're depicted, the kingdoms and their kings are depicted like animals. But then after that, God's kingdom is depicted as a human-like one, one like the Son of Man. And, um, and, and the, uh, God's people suffer under the hands of that final kingdom. But then they're finally exalted with their king, the son of man. And then the son of man is worshiped. And so like the son of man is like human identifying with his people, but he's also divine receiving worship. Like there's a bridge between the two. Well, in Jesus, we see the fulfillment of that. Um, what people were not expecting, you know, the, here's the suffering servant. Here's the Davidic Messiah. Here's the son of man. They weren't expecting them all to be the same person or God coming to redeem his people. They weren't expecting, but, but Jesus was the fulfillment of all of that. But like the son of man identifying with his people, suffering under the hands of the, the final empire, they were, they were expecting the Messiah to come and overthrow Rome. They weren't expecting him to come and be overthrown, crucified by Rome. But Jesus... Uh, Jesus is also the suffering servant, uh, identifying with his people. He's, uh, he, he, like the first half of the Gospel of Mark, it takes even his disciples, the first half of the Gospel of Mark, to figure out, oh, Jesus is the Messiah. Duh. Mm. <laughs> I mean, he's doing all these miracles and stuff, but yeah, they weren't expecting the Messiah necessarily to do miracles. So he's, um, he's the Messiah. And then the second half of the Gospel of Mark, it takes the disciples the second half to realize that what he's saying about his death and resurrection mm. is what it means for him to be the Messiah. And the resurrection was the proof. Jesus didn't come just to defeat Rome. Rome, Rome was a non-issue mm. at that point. Jesus came to defeat death and to bring new life into the world. And... <clears throat> So you can render to Caesar what's Caesar's, but to God what's God's. You know, who cares about Caesar? Just give him what he wants. <laughs> but give God what's made in God's image. Give God yourself. Mm. And <clears throat> Jesus will come back. He'll fulfill, you know, all the all the promises. But at the first phase, 
of the mission, he brought new life into the world so that when Jesus comes again in the day of judgment, we've got a people who are ready for him because we're, we're walking with him, we know him. Or, um, I keep going back to the Jewish people that uh, rejected Jesus. Um, so they, they re today, I guess, they would reject the New Testament, um, right? And, but, so um, do we fit in like the Gentiles in their opinion? Do they, um, do we fall into their es eschatology? Um, you know, if, if they're still expecting the Messiah to come, is it, is it like, is their view mostly like, focusing on Israel, like the people of Israel, or, or do they, do they um, accept other books in the New Testament, or, or is it just the first books? Well, I mean, again, there are different Jewish views, and of course, Messianic Jewish views are, you okay. know, <laughs> do accept the New Testament, right. but for Jewish people who don't believe in Jesus, uh, well, and actually don't, don't believe in Jesus as the Messiah, Mm -hmm. and certainly as divine mm -hmm. for Jewish people who don't believe that even so I mean there were so many prophecies in Isaiah and mm -hmm. Zechariah and so on uh, about the Gentiles mm -hmm. being um, you know turning to God some of them it's like they come and they serve Israel but you've got these others where um, like Isaiah chapter 19 and I'm not saying I mean most people who are ethnically Jewish in, in the U.S., for example, today are probably like most Christians, uh, or at least, you know, those who claim to be Christians in the U.S. today, in terms of how well they know Isaiah 19. <laughs> so, okay. but Isaiah 19 um, talks about, you know, God making Assyria and Egypt part of his people along with Israel. I mean, so you've got, you've got passages like that. Um, <clears throat> And that's part of, I think, what Paul argues in Romans chapter 11. He's like, well, he, here we are, this ingathering of Gentiles. It's being fulfilled through Jesus. So if you don't believe the promises about Jesus' resurrection, if you don't believe that that's, you know, you don't believe the witnesses and that, well, look around, be a witness yourself of how all these Gentiles are coming to the one true God of Israel because of Jesus. <clears throat> And there, there are actually um, some Jewish people today who say, well, you know, Christianity has been good in terms of bringing Gentiles to God. And so, you know, it's great for Gentiles, but they believe in the, you know, these Gentile Christians, they believe in the Trinity. And, you know, God has a higher standard for us Jews. We have to believe just the oneness of God in the sense of not a Trinity, but in the sense of like, just um, just one person within the Godhead, so to speak. Oh. So, again, there are different different Jewish views today, but many of them do recognize, hey, it's great that mm -hmm. Gentiles believe in the one true God. It's, oh, okay. uh, But they also, I mean, they can look back and see a history of Christian anti-Semitism, mm -hmm. uh, and that's been a real, mm -hmm. um, I mean, and that's, Paul warns against that in Romans 11 too. He says, the Gentile branches should not boast against the Jewish branches. Mm -hmm. So his, his idea that the influx of the Gentiles would be a witness to the Jewish people, but not if the Gentiles are anti-Jewish. Oh, <laughs> so, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we have a, um, because of some of what's gone on in the history of the Christian church, we have a, we have a bad legacy to uh, make up for, I guess. Right. It's a stumbling block. Yes. For the gospel to them. So let's move on to another question by Cecilia. It's actually my big sister who left this question on Facebook. Uh, does the Bible speak on how much our faith will be tested because of the mention of the mark on the forehead, hands, etc., in those final days leading to the day God calls his people to join him? Yes. Um, in terms of, of testing, 
it's all over the place in the Bible. So we, I wouldn't even, yeah, I wouldn't really even know where to start. But in terms of the, the mark, um, something interesting about that is the context of that, because the mark identifies somebody as a follower of the beast, and the mark includes the name of the beast or the, or the number of his name. Um, back then, each letter in Greek and also in Hebrew had a particular numerical value. They didn't, they didn't have like numerals like we have in Greek or Hebrew. They had uh, letters that counted also as numerals, uh, depending on whether you were reading them as letters or numerals. But right after that passage, that's 13, 16 through 18 of, of Revelation, right after that, no chapter breaks in the original. There's, of course, Revelation 14, 1, where you have 144,000 standing on Mount Zion, and on them is the name of the Lamb. So you've got either the name of the Lamb or the name of the beast. And the beast looks more powerful in the eyes of the world. I mean, the Lamb. The lamb was slain, you know, the epitome of vulnerability, the cross. But we either follow the beast or the lamb. You got to serve somebody. And it's also interesting elsewhere in Revelation, uh, Revelation 3.12 will be described as pillars in the, in the temple of our God in the New Jerusalem. Um, of course, it doesn't mean we'll be literally, you know, standing there holding the, the roof in place. But pillars were an image of strength, and people often have inscriptions on pillars. And it says in, in Revelation 3.12 that the na name of God and the name of the new Jerusalem will be written on us. Well, it identifies us as God's people. And then the, the 144,000, uh, the seal that's on them in Revelation 7. And then you have um, Revelation chapter 22 around verses three through six somewhere, it says that his servants will serve him before his face and his name will be on, on us. Um, again, it doesn't mean like literally written on us, just like it didn't mean literally that we'll be pillars, but it identifies us as, as God's people. You also have Revelation 17, somewhere around four or five, where it says, mis, uh, describing the, the prostitute Babylon, that on her name or on her forehead will be a name written, mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes. Well, it doesn't mean that if you, if you meet a prostitute and you're about to witness to a prostitute, you say, oh, wow, oh, I read about your mom. You know, it's not, not literal because this isn't a literal, you know, this is a, you know, an image, in, and again, in Revelation 19, when Jesus comes back, he has a name written on him, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. D does he have it literally inscribed on him, or is it, is it a way of, you know, John is having a vision, so he knows who this is, because John can read, and he sees, sees the name written on him. So I'm not sure if the mark of the beast is actually a literal mark, or if it represents, you know, the contrast between that and the name of the lamb written on us. You've got to serve somebody. You either serve God and the lamb or you serve the beast. Um, whether it's literal or not, uh, it, it, does, it does point to that application that, yeah, the world may seem to have more power. They, they may say, you've got to do this to be part of us. But every day, we get tested with things like that. And like Daniel and his three friends, you know, before Daniel's tested with the lion's den, before his three friends are tested with the burning fiery furnace, they're tested with the king's food. They're tested for 10 days, just like Revelation 2.10, I believe, says that, uh, of the church in Smyrna, you'll be tested for 10 days. We, if we can pass the smaller tests, then we'll be ready for the bigger tests. Okay, <clears throat> I can't find who asked this question right now, but someone asked, who is the Satan that is 
mentioned in Revelation? I, I would see that as the same, um, same Satan mentioned elsewhere in the, in the New Testament. Um, now, is it talking about Satan or the Antichrist, the question? Hmm, maybe the person's not sure. Um, who, who is the bad guy in the end times? <laughs> <laughs> There's a bunch of them. Oh, okay. But, uh, obviously, Satan is behind it. So you have the, the dragon in the book of Revelation who represents Satan, and you have uh, the beast, but the beast looks like, looks like the dragon, you know, seven heads. By the way, the, the prostitute. <laughs> so this lovely prostitute, seven heads, you know, 10 <laughs> horns. You know, people really knew what evil really looked like. Come on. <laughs> so, um, so the, but the beast looks like its dad, looks like Satan. Um, and so, so it's kind of, you know, they're, they're, they're linked together. But in terms of who the, who the beast is, it's interesting you've got in Revelation 13, going back to the four beasts of Daniel chapter seven, it doesn't just look like the last of the four. It looks like a blending of all four. So, you know, it's like the spirit of evil empire. It's like all of them blended together. And then in terms of the Antichrist, uh, Revelation actually doesn't use the word Antichrist. It just, you know, it speaks of the beast, speaks of an evil king, um, final evil king. But as 1 John 2.18 says, you've heard that an Antichrist is coming. Even now there are many Antichrists. And then it goes on to say, who's the Antichrist except the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? Well, that, that's an Antichrist. <laughs> um, so... There's a sense, I mean, evil is already in the world, so the principles are the same. It's just like um, when you've heard that an Antichrist is coming, well, there's like a, an epitomization of that, maybe toward the end. Now, my understanding of how we would know which one is the final one is when Jesus comes and wipes them out. Ah, okay, that was the final one. There's no more after that, but, but you know... Um, we, we do have uh, already to contend with that in the world. Now, when I, when I would teach Revelation to my master's students, the first week I'd give them an assignment for the second week, and that is go online and find the craziest things you can about the Antichrist. And so, <clears throat> depending on who was president at the time and the political parties of the people who were posting, the Antichrist was usually the uh, candidate from the opposite political party. Um, so Democrats at one point were saying it was uh, Ronald Wilson Reagan with six letters in his first, middle, and last name. Um, and of course, Republicans were saying, you know, at one point it was Bill Clinton and it was Obama. And, you know, but just, it just depends on, you know, not everybody's saying the same thing, but I mean, one of the craziest things was um, if you send us some money now, when the rapture occurs and you go to heaven, we'll take care of your pet during the great tribulation. That was my favorite of the, like, who's, who's really going to do that? <laughs> Stop yeah. it. Wow. Um, yeah, I, I think a lot of people get things online. And <laughs> unfortunately, they believe it. Um, I, I think I've heard someone say that the Pope is the Antichrist as well? Luther said the Pope was the Antichrist. The Pope okay. thought that Luther was the Antichrist. But anyway, <laughs> so, I, and, and part of it, you can make anything come out to 666 if you make up the rules as you go. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you do it by ancient, uh, you know, the numerals representing letters, there were certain ways you could calculate. Mm -hmm. And so one of the common ones in the early church was if you spell Nero Caesar in Hebrew letters, and then calculate the number, it can come out to 666. Hmm. And interestingly, in the Armenian language, even today, Nero is the word for Antichrist. So huh. people saw him definitely as an Antichrist. He was, you know, 
burning Christians alive to light his imperial gardens at night and so on. Uh, if, if it's a, an allusion to Nero, which would have made sense in the first century, because there were, we do know from Roman sources, there were a lot of people saying that Nero was coming back. But it, it you know, that, that even though everybody mm -hmm. thought he died, well, a lot of people thought he died, most people thought he was coming back. And, mm -hmm. and he, actually, there were imposters actually rose claiming to be Nero. Some of them got the Parthians to follow them across the river Euphrates and invade the Roman Empire just a few years before Revelation was written. But I don't believe, you know, it's, it's actually Nero coming back. Mm -hmm. But the, the idea would be, you know, drawing on the images of the day to say, you thought Nero was bad. Mm -hmm. Wait till you see what's coming. It would be mm -hmm. like today saying you thought Hitler was bad. Or mm -hmm. Stalin, I mean, how could you get worse than that? Mm -hmm. But, you know, we're going to, yeah. In other words, we need to be ready to suffer, but our hope is the coming of Jesus. And that's what we, we look to, to, to deliver us. I, am I going too far off the questions? No, it's fine. It's good with me. Um, I was thinking of asking you, because I do know that there are certain views. I, I wanted to ask you um, about if you could share your experience, uh, you know, uh, with eschatology a little bit, but I want, I did want to ask before that if, um, it, so would that be a weak argument for other Christian views to, to, um, to hold to that, um, uh, that Nero was already like fulfilled part of eschatology because you said that it's very easy to make certain, um, the, the 666, is mm -hmm. that a weak point in, other Christians' arguments? Yeah, I guess usually when we when we think of eschatological views, it's not like well, among among Christian scholars, we don't we don't think of like a, a view being this being the Antichrist or that person being the Antichrist. Um, you know, in terms of on the popular level, yeah, yeah like I think Salem Kirban said that Henry Kissinger, Nixon's Secretary of State, was the Antichrist. Uh, this was back in the 70s. And, and you know, so the, <laughs> um, people have been naming Antichrists for a long time. Mm. But, uh, and actually, there's one, there's one on the internet, I think it was intended as a joke, mm. Barney the dinosaur. Um, if you take a cute purple dinosaur, and you take um, the things that could be converted to Roman numerals out of that, and you add up the Roman numerals, it comes out to 666. Oh. And, and so they said, Barney the dinosaur is the Antichrist. Um, but, but in terms of scholarly views, like about the millennium or the tribulation or things like that, um, this, this wouldn't really make a difference on those. Okay. But you know, in terms of identifying Antichrist figures, well, <clears throat> there have been, like First John 2.18 says, there are, even now there are many antichrists. Okay. So we do need to be careful. Um, history is littered with all sorts of predictions. Mm -hmm. And even though Jesus said, no one knows the day nor the hour, mm -hmm. it hasn't stopped people from trying. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe it was Hippolytus said the antichrist would come by the year 500. And St. Martin of Tours said that the antichrist had already been born in his day. And Martin died around the year 397. So if it's, if it's the final Antichrist already born in Martin's day, mm -hmm. the Antichrist is very old by now. Uh, yeah. Again, this has been going on for a long, long time. Right. Um, and so, so mm -hmm. the question your children asked about, you know, right. <laughs> why hasn't this happened yet? Well, people have been, you know, kind of impatient and trying to, the, the, one, the one profitable thing about people looking for those things is that we recognize, okay, well, how does what's going on now, could this be the time of the end? So we're always looking for, we're always ready. Um, but yeah, the exact shape it will take, I don't think that's the, the point in Revelation, figuring out exactly which mm -hmm. head is which and which horn is which mm -hmm. is not so much the point is, you know, yeah. you're going to serve the beast, you're going to serve the lamb. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. So um, I heard a little bit 
of your story where you you seemed to me like you were someone that was really hungry to learn about you know eschatology and you had to seek that out for yourself can you talk a little bit about those days and how eventually you landed on your own view and can you share a little bit of your view sure did, did you want me to say something about eschatology in general first or save that for later mm, i'll leave it up to you <laughs> do you want me to choose um, <laughs> the, the people who want something controversial will want the 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 uh, my view first i guess but oh um, yeah <clears throat> but let's hold them in suspense a little bit and just okay. yeah <laughs> just a little bit don't 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 go away yeah but, um, good idea yeah but when we think of eschatology like what we said about the, the the jewish views that predominated at the time of jesus nobody was really expecting two stages i mean you can see it sometimes Times, like Psalm 110 verse 1, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Well, there's a space in between. Or like God was going to bring about a new exodus, the prophet said. Well, when God brought his people out of the land of Egypt, he didn't bring them immediately into the promised land. He was waiting on them for some stuff. And so um, you, you, can, you can see the potential for that. But in any case, when Jesus, when Jesus came, we who are Christians, we understand that Jesus is coming again to consummate his kingdom, but we already believe he's already come. <laughs> the, the king has already come. Because of that, we understand, you know, and, and the resurrection from the dead is future, but it's already rooted in history because Jesus has risen from the dead. Paul calls it the first fruits of our resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15. So because of that, we understand that um, the kingdom comes in two stages, two phases, uh, depending on your view of the millennium, maybe, maybe three stages, but at least two, <laughs> no matter what. So we believe that Jesus, um, <clears throat> it's like he talks about in his parable, the mustard seed. It's like this little mustard seed, you know, you can, you can hold it just so many, so many of those mustard seeds in your hand, they're so tiny, uh, especially um, the black mustard, which is probably what he's talking about. Very, very small, looks like almost like pepper. But then that seed that looks so obscure and so tiny, eventually is, you know, the birds can come and, and perch in its branches, you know, it becomes a, a massive kingdom that nobody can ignore. Well, Jesus coming is like that. And so you have, in a sense, where we have been, Paul puts it this way in Galatians 1.4, Christ came, died for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age. In Greek, it's not just world, it, it means age, this present era. We don't belong to this. We, we belong to the future world. Romans 12, 2, don't be conformed, literally it says, to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Think the new way, think in light of eternity. Second Corinthians chapter 5 has the same, the same idea. You know, once we knew things according to the, the world's way of thinking, we even knew Christ that way, but, but we don't know that way anymore. If anyone is in Christ, there's a new creation. So we're, we're participating in the, uh, or Hebrews chapter six talks about, we've tasted of the powers of the age to come. So in a sense, we are people of a future age. We live according to the values of the future age. We don't live according to the values of Babylon. We live according to the values of the new Jerusalem, which is so much greater than Babylon, but isn't yet seen to those who don't have the eyes of faith. And in, but, but we have a foretaste. That's what gives us the confidence. 2 Corinthians 1, 2 Corinthians 5, Ephesians 1, verses 13 and 14, talks about us having the, it's translated different ways in different translations, but it's the arhabon, uh, translated like the first installment or the, um, the earnest, I think the King James said, 
or the guarantee, maybe the NASB, uh, old NSB. Um, literally, it's a word used in business documents for the down payment. So we have the first installment of our future inheritance in the kingdom. And, and the way he specifies it, he, he says, the spirit is the, is the down payment. Um, or even in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, eye has not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered the human heart the things that God has prepared for those who love him. But, he says in verse 10, God has revealed these things to us by the spirit. So because of our experience of the spirit, we have a foretaste of the coming world. Uh, Acts chapter 2, verses 17 and 18 I'll pour out my, uh, in the last days, says God, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Uh, the, I mentioned the daughters because uh, of your holding up that book earlier, but yes. Um, God, God has poured out the spirit. That's what's characteristic of believers in this age. God has given us the spirit. We have an experience of God. We know that God is real. We know that the promised future is real. We are, um, we're groaning with birth pangs, awaiting it. All creation is groaning. The spirit within us is, is groaning for that. Um, so, so we're already experiencing something eschatological. As, as we wait for the fullness, the consummation, um, the sufferings of this age are birth pangs for the coming age. Um, so all, the, all that to say, the, the most important stuff about eschatology isn't something Christians have to disagree on. I mean, the king has come, the king is yet to come. And most of the passages about his coming in the New Testament, the focus is how we should live in light of his coming. Well, we live in expectation, we live in, in earnest hope, uh, but hope not in the sense in English, like, I just hope it happens, but hope in the sense of you know, this is our solid hope. We, we live, we die in expectation of the greater world that awaits because we already have a foretaste of that world by, by God's spirit. And so we live, we live holy lives consecrated to God. Uh, in, in Revelation, you have these, these two, uh, two kingdoms. You have Babylon, which I don't think has to be understood literally because in Revelation 11, 8, you have <clears throat> the great city, which also in Revelation is Babylon, but also called Sodom, Egypt, and where our Lord was crucified. Well, those are four different geographic locations, <laughs> but they're, they're all assimilated because <clears throat> Babylon, I mean, the Babylon of John's day, I think everybody would understand back then, just based on the description of it in Revelation 17 and 18, how it fits what was known back then, the Babylon of John's day was Rome, you know, the Roman Empire. But the spirit of Babylon goes beyond Rome. And, uh, you know, like the blending of the four, the four beasts in Revelation 13, the, the spirit of, of evil empire, well, you have Babylon portrayed as a prostitute, the New Jerusalem is portrayed as a bride. And um, the, the feminine images are not meant to be sexist. It's, you know, the cities portrayed themselves as, as women on their coins back then. So it's understood, you know, these are representing two cities, but the, the contrast between Babel and the prostitute, New Jerusalem, the bride, or for, for masculine image, the, the chastity of the 144,000, um, the contrast those who live for the temporary gratification of this world settle for the gratification of temporary gratification of what's like a prostitute. But those who live in expectation of the world to come, we are the bride of Christ who will be with him forever and ever, experiencing his glory and experiencing his presence, like in the Holy of Holies. You know, the New Jerusalem shaped like a cube. That's the shape of the Holy of Holies in the Old Testament. We'll be in the presence of God undistracted forever and ever. And we have a foretaste of that now by, by the Spirit. So, okay, 
So I can go on to the controversial stuff now if you want. Or um, just, <laughs> I just wanted to make a maybe an application yes. of um, what you were saying that um, the way we live is um, because we're living in such a way in light of the coming age. Mm -hmm. And so if we are living according to like how the spirit is leading us to live mm -hmm. here, um, then it's also like we're showing the world the a glimpse of the future age, yes. Yes. right? And um, I guess eschatology doesn't really seem like something that's relevant um, to Christianity, to a lot of Christians, unfortunately. Um, but it seems that if, if we are like really thinking about it, it should motivate us more to evangelize. Yes. Um, and even the way we live, because we're mindful that the people we love are going to be the bride or they're they're going to spend the rest of their existence with God or not. Mm -hmm. Right. So this every, topic is important for that. Yeah. As well. Yeah. Every moment of this life, I mean, we're gonna have forever. So every moment of this life counts toward that forever and we want to make as much of a difference in this in this world as we can in helping people and loving people in you know the, the body of christ being united together i mean that's how the world will see a foretaste of what the coming world is like is by how we treat one another how we treat them and how faithful we are to the message of the gospel Mm -hmm. And before you talk about the, I guess, the distinctions or the differences, would you mind um, saying the things that every Christian should agree on, like simple terms like the millennium? I think for some of us, it's really hard to understand, like, what is that tribulation even? Yeah, Maybe you could explain. <clears throat> Christians disagree on those. Okay. But on, you know, the basics, Jesus is coming back. And so looking for his return, evangelizing the world. I mean, the simple basics are things that we can all agree on. Uh, it gets more complicated with some of the other, like, what is the millennium? Well, that depends on your view. <laughs> so <clears throat> here, uh, uh, Revelation chapter 20 speaks of, those who've suffered, have been beheaded for the testimony about Jesus, uh, come back to life and they reign with Christ for a thousand years. And at the end of the thousand years, you have judgment on, on the wicked who persist in their wickedness. Um, <clears throat> the devil's not able to, to do anything during the thousand years, uh, but then at the end comes back and you find out, well, some people, they still want to follow evil. And anyway, so the question is, is this a literal thousand years? And is it future or does it symbolize the present age? And here's where the views diverge. So for the, um, in the second century, like the New Testament is from the first century. Second century, you have various church fathers who spoke of the thousand years as a future period. They believed that they were in the tribulation. They, they were suffering under antichrists or, or would suffer under antichrists, but they believed the thousand years was future. But even then there were some people who knew about other views. Uh, Justin Martyr talks about that in the mid second century. <clears throat> but then in later centuries, the dominant view came to be, no, we're in the millennium now. So after the persecutions ended, when Constantine became emperor, some of Constantine's advocates said, well, okay, the tribulation's over. We're now in the thousand years. And people said, well, we haven't been raised yet. But um, Eusebius was a, a, a writer in the, in the 300s. And he said, you know, the, these people who believe in a future thousand years, who don't believe we're in the thousand years now, the difference between them and other heretics is we can talk them out of their out of their error. So you call them heretics. Uh, and then 
you know, by the time you get to Augustine, Augustine lays the groundwork for uh, what's probably the dominant amillennial view now, where between the first coming and the second coming, the millennium symbolizes that, that yeah, the saints may suffer with Christ, but spiritually we reign with Christ, uh, even in the midst of our suffering. And so um, that was the view that dominated in the Middle Ages. It wasn't the only view. Um, it's also the view held by, by Luther, by Calvin, uh, by many of the reformers. Then there were a lot of people who said, well, no, we can, what God wants us to do, preach the good news among all the nations, then the end will come. We are supposed to set up the kingdom on earth uh, and get things ready, and then Jesus will come back, the post-millennial view. And that seems to have been held by John Wesley. It was held by uh, Jonathan Edwards, Charles Finney, you know, a lot of the people we respect from the 1700s, 1700s, 1800s. Um, almost, I was going to say almost nobody holds it today, but actually there are a lot of people who, who now hold it. It's, it's had a resurgence. Um, and then around 1830, there was a, another view that came out. It was a form of the premillennial view, future thousand years, but it added another distinctive. It said, there will be a period of great tribulation right before the end, and it will be seven years, and the church will not have to go through that because God doesn't deal with Israel and with the church at the same time. Now, for people who hold a view like that today, they often, you know, they might, they might say, wait, that doesn't sound like quite our view. Well, it's changed over time. But when it, when it came out, it was like God can't deal with the church and Israel at the same time. So for this final uh, period of suffering before Jesus comes back, there will be, um, Christians won't have to go through that. They'll be raptured at beforehand. The Schofield Reference Bible really made that popular. It became extremely popular in the early 1900s. And uh, probably through the mid-1900s. mid, mid -1900s. Uh, But Again, there have been different views, probably, yeah, well, there's still different views, just, <laughs> so um, the earliest church fathers believed in the future millennium. They believed they were either in the great tribulation or about to go through it. Later church fathers believed they were probably most of them done with the tribulation, um, but in the, in the millennium. Um, and through history, a lot of people believe they were in the tribulation and in the millennium. Uh, today, you have people who, who believe that or who believe in a future tribulation and a future millennium or a present tribulation and a future millennium or a present tribulation and a present millennium. <laughs> so, uh, or a fu future millennium, but Jesus comes back at the end rather than the beginning. So those are, the, those are an array of different views. <clears throat> there are so many people that we respect through church history who have held these different views. And often our views are shaped by, you know, what's dominant in our era, what's dominant, well, for a lot of people today on social media, or what's dominant um, in our, you know, our denomination, which was founded when a certain view was dominant. So certain denominations are all millennial, present millennium, certain other denominations are pre-millennial, future millennium, <laughs> and, and so on. So that's, a, that's kind of a survey of some of these major uh, divisions of, of thought. I still haven't told you my view. <laughs> did you? you? You didn't, right? Okay. Um, is there anything else that... Um... Oh, um, maybe we can talk about the left behind um, a little bit. Did you want to say that after you share your own view or? No, that's fine. Uh, no, I, I shouldn't keep people in suspense forever. But, <laughs> but just think, think how long we've been waiting for, you know, yeah. eschatology, right? So, <laughs> yeah. you know, this is, this is a podcast. We're not supposed to do that. So um, I, was, I was taught a certain view as a young Christian, like again, I was converted from atheism. So I just, you know, I figured other people know 
I just need to listen to what they tell me. So what I was taught was the church, well, there's a future thousand years, but that wasn't really the focus. The focus was there's a future tribulation and Christians will be raptured out before the tribulation. That's what I was taught. And then um, as I was reading the scriptures, it was like, none of these verses and context seem to say that, but these people know more than I do. So I'm just gonna take their word for it. And, um, and then one of my friends had a dream in which we were going through the great tribulation. And he said, I think that's probably right. And I'm like, well, that would make more sense of these verses and context. So my pastor was like, I don't think that's right, but you know, it's not a big deal, which, you know, it's a, <laughs> it's, he's right. You know, I mean, we don't need to divide over these things, but um, <clears throat> when I, as I, as I searched the text all in context, it became increasingly clear to me that actually no, the time when we are caught up to meet the Lord in the air is the same as when the Lord is, is descending from heaven and he's gonna rule the, rule the earth. There's no, there's nothing in context that actually says that those are different comings. And therefore, if the rapture and the second coming are the same thing, then <clears throat> there's no getting out before this great tribulation. And a guest evangelist took me aside and said, no, I'm going to persuade you. But every verse he looked at, I would just look at the context and say, but it says this. And he just got mad finally. He gave up. He was very patient, but he finally got mad and said, look, all men of God hold this view. Jim Baker, Jimmy Swagger, all men of God hold this view, which was you know, the dominant popular view in the 1970s. And of course, Jim Baker has since changed his view on that. But uh, and of course, there been, <laughs> but I didn't know. I mean, there were plenty of people who held other views. And so when, um, when, when, so I, I, but anyway, I said, okay, well, you're right. I mean, it seems to me the Bible says this, but I need to believe what all my elders in the Lord say. And then I found out a little while later, oh, actually, most people through church history didn't hold this view. Most of the people who respect for church history didn't hold this view. And a whole lot of people today don't hold this view. So, you know, naming just as many people who were famous at that time. And I'm like, okay, from now on, I'm just gonna go with what the Bible says. So that was a big turning point in my you know, journey towards being a biblical scholar. And just, just go with what the Bible says. Um, but in terms of, <clears throat> The, the view was popularized by certain prophecy teachers at the time, Hal Lindsey, late great planet Earth, which kind of seemed to hint that the Lord would come back by 1988, um, 40 years from 1948, which of course it didn't happen. Um, but I mean, there were good things about it, like be ready for the Lord's coming. <laughs> but you know, the, the um, locusts in Revelation being a, a patchy, attack helicopters, you know, some, some of the things kind of have grown out of date. <laughs> um, but uh, more recently, it's been the Left Behind series. And so Michael Brown and I, who co-wrote this book, we talked about how we both left behind, left behind eschatology because um, this idea that the church will be raptured before the tribulation doesn't actually work when you look at the verses in there in their context. And, you know, we can go on to look at the verses in their context, but I'm just giving you a summary of how I came to, to the, that view. So maybe going back to how we began, like if you had to explain to a child, what is going to happen to us if, if Jesus comes in our generation, what exactly would that look like are we like living in are we supposed to be living in like really terrible times right now and we're going to see Jesus in the clouds we're going to go up and we're going to come back down how would you explain it <laughs> yeah <laughs> um, well we meet him on his way down I mean the the word up and taste us uh, for the meeting him in the air when it's used elsewhere in the New Testament 
the, the Greek word normally means meeting some somebody on their way and escorting them. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But I mean it doesn't have to mean that, but mm -hmm. that's usually what it means, especially if you're meeting some important figure at the important figure's parousia or coming. Um, but also, I mean, you have, oh, sorry, I, I better answer your question before I digress. I'm, I'm ADHD. You've probably noticed I, I digress a lot. And so it's actually built into my nervous system. But anyway, um, in, if I'm explaining it to a child, it's like, there's gonna be heaven on earth. Uh, Jesus will come back. There's gonna be peace. There's gonna be no more fighting. Uh, you won't beat up your, your kid brother anymore uh, <laughs> or your sister. Uh, you, everybody will be nice. So, um, but before that, yeah, I mean, until that day comes, this world includes suffering and death. And in some parts of the world right now, Christians are already, you know, killed for their faith persecuted for their faith, certainly marginalized for their faith, then you can have that happen here too. I mean, I, I've been beaten for my witness on the streets before. I've had my life threatened before for my witness. And uh, certainly, you know, working on my PhD in a secular institution, I, I had people who were very supportive, you know, very, you know, saying, we don't care what your personal views are, just as long as you do good work. Others who were supportive, they actually were Christians themselves, but then there were others who were like, you shouldn't even be allowed to graduate, you're too religious. You know, so um, if you remember God's Not Dead One, Professor Radisson, uh, for those who've seen the movie, and some people said, you don't have professors like that. Uh, I have had professors <laughs> like that, you know, who like, oh no, you know, you're an idiot if you believe in this. Uh, one, one professor said, any, any, anybody who publicly professes faith in God should be fired. This is a university professor who said wow. this. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, you have professors teaching all sorts of things, but uh, I mean, most of his colleagues didn't agree with him, mm -hmm. but you do have people like that. So, I mean, you can suffer for your faith anywhere. Mm -hmm. Second Timothy 3.12, 3, all those who want to live godly in Christ Jesus will, will suffer persecution. So, whatever your eschatological view is, you need to be ready to suffer for Jesus. But we hold on because we don't live for Babylon. We live for the new Jerusalem. We, we live in light of, of the expectation of Jesus' return. Do, do you want me to go into some of the detailed arguments for why people hold certain views? We we can, but I just had one more question about sure. that view. Um, before it's heaven on earth, um, so would we? Do we hold as Christians that something terrible is going to happen in the world? Uh, even like, like the the Bible verses that talk about the sun and the moon, and um, so is so it, it's it is tr like tribulation going to be? something like we've never seen before so it things are going to get really really bad as bad as they've ever been especially to christians and then that's when jesus is coming back and and creating like this new world and and then people are going to be judged and all of that is is that correct i i do think there's an intensification of it at the end i do believe that um but in terms of what that looks like, um, okay. I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, uh, well, I'm, I mean, just just to say, I'm not sure is like, if I were living in Nazi Germany, mm. would I have would I have not thought that was the final tribulation? Or if I were living in North Korea right now. When I really know the difference. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, uh, thinking in in those terms, okay. but uh, Jesus said they can't do anything worse to you than to kill your body. People have been doing that to us for a long time, mm -hmm. but not always everywhere all through the world. So, will it happen everywhere all through the world? Um, If it depends on how literal it is. 
Second yeah. Thessalonians 2 makes me think there is a final, a final one, a final tribulation. And but whether that's true or not, in terms of application, mm -hmm. we all need to live like we're ready for that. The, the seven churches in Revelation, only two of them were actually suffering mm. direct, well, serious level of persecution. There was another one that had had somebody killed for their faith. But two of them in, in, in Smyrna and Philadelphia, they were facing a lot of persecution. Mm. One of those churches, Smyrna, is told, be faithful to death and I'll give you the crown of life. Philadelphia is told they'll be delivered from theirs. Mm. Most of the other churches were suffering. Well, <laughs> most of the other churches were experiencing very various levels of compromise with the values of the same world that was killing their brothers and sisters elsewhere. So on the level of personal application, I would say, if we're not suffering persecution at a great level of intensity, let's learn from our brothers and sisters who are so that we don't become like the dead church in Sardis or like the lukewarm church in Laodicea. Mm -hmm. So we don't end up just living like the world does, mm -hmm. but that we live in light of eternity the way the persecuted churches have to do to survive. Mm -hmm. we, can, we can learn from those. So we need to be ready if that comes. But again, the, the best way to do that, the best way to be ready for greater testing and greater tribulation is to pass the tests and the tribulations we have now. So, so on this level of application, what I'm saying should be relevant, whatever your view is. Okay, um, because um, so there, is there a tie between um, being aware that Jesus can come at any moment and in the way that we're living? Um, because if, if we're thinking that he's not coming anytime soon, then that would mean that the way that we live would conform to the world. Yeah. We just, we just try to, hey, look, this is what our neighbors are doing. Hey, look at their big swimming pool. I want one of those. And uh, I'm, I'm not saying it's wrong to have a swimming pool, but, right. um, but if we live in light of eternity oh, yeah. and all of our resources, our time, our, yeah. our money, everything, we're going to put it towards mm -hmm. making a difference for Christ in this world. I mean, oh. we're, we're waiting for heaven on earth at Jesus' second coming, but there's a sense in which, you know, I mean, we're already praying, you know, uh, for, for, um, God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. I mean, mm -hmm. we want to make a difference for heaven on earth now mm -hmm. insofar as we can. I mean, obviously we can't, um, I'm not post-millennial. I don't, I don't believe that uh, we set up the, the kingdom and then Jesus comes back. I, mm -hmm. I, uh, but I do believe that we try to make as big of a difference for Jesus as we can. Mm -hmm. And the things that Jesus cared about, he healed the sick, he uh, fed the multitudes when there wasn't enough food um, through prayer. I believe, you know, I, I believe definitely, you know, again, with the spirit being the foretaste of the kingdom, I believe God still does miracles today. Mm -hmm. but, but when there isn't a dramatic miracle, we're still responsible to care about these things that Jesus cares about. So, mm -hmm. you know, caring about people's health, caring about people's um, having food to eat, you know, and, and, um, just showing showing the love of Christ for people in this world, making a difference for for His honor in, in every way we can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, being being um, aware of God's kingdom, like yes. every single moment. Um, yes. um, I would love for you to uh, maybe tell people if you know they're not in right standing with God, how they could. Um, have a relationship with him yeah yeah that's that's the most important thing because someday we're going to be we're going to stand before him and we want to be one of his own <laughs> um, that's why Jesus came into the world before um, not just with the second coming not just to judge the world but he came first to bring salvation to have a people ready for him. 
And Jesus offers us that. I mean, he, he came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He died for us. He, he rose again, which is the, you know, he opened the way for eternal life for us to, to live forever with him, uh, resurrection life. And what he wants us to do, therefore, he, he's, he offers us that eternal life as a free gift, but eternal life with him has to start now. So you have to be... Um, the Bible talks about eternal life beginning with when you're born from above, John chapter 3. Um, you get a new life. So we, we've been living for Babylon. We've been living for the world. But we can now change sides, be on the side of the New Jerusalem, be on the side of Jesus, uh, be on the side of the lamb instead of the beast. And the way you start that is by recognizing that God has given us the gift. He paid for it already with the death of his own son. And so you begin by saying, God, I welcome that gift. I welcome the gift of a new life. I want to be on your side. I want to live for you now. I don't want to live the other way. And you don't have to wait until you feel like, boy, I can get it together. You know, just like I don't think Jesus coming is waiting for us to set up the kingdom either. Um, you, you don't wait until like, oh boy, okay, Lord, now I'm convinced I will live perfectly for you. God is the one who changes us. So you just say, God, I recognize what Jesus did. I, I know you can put your spirit within me. You can make me new. And so again, to explain it the way we would often explain it to a child, you can ask you say, okay, Jesus died for me. Jesus rose. I accept the gift. Come and live inside of me. And that's the beginning of a new life. And then if you want to find out some guidance for how to live the new life. Well, we've got a whole Bible to, to talk about that. Um, I mean, you uh, baptism is a way of showing that you're, you've decided to follow Jesus. Uh, and then the way we live <laughs> is a way of, of showing that we've decided to follow, follow Jesus. Yes, very good. Um, and since we've run out of time, thank you so much for all of this time. Um, can you recommend some resources for us to go further into this topic? Would you say yeah. your book um, that we were talking about would be a good place to start? Or do you have any other resources? Yeah, that's a good place to start for our view. Uh, not afraid of the Antichrist. <laughs> um, but but um, there are, yeah, in our view would be um, considered post-tribulational premillennial or historic premillennial, it's also called. Um, although I think a good, a good case, people have also made a good case for the amillennial view. I mean, I think those are the two strongest views <sighs> with some things like the millennium you know you'll find out when you get there it's not something you have to argue about now but uh but but there are multiple views books um a, a number a number of places have published those uh, zondervan has a number of those um so like three views of the millennium or four views of the end times or things like that those are are very helpful for getting that a survey of the views. Uh, back when I was a young Christian, um, some of the views supporting my, my position were like uh, George Ladd's book, The, the Blessed Hope. Um, <laughs> there was a, there were books by um, uh, John Walvoord on the pre-tribulational rapture. And I actually, when people used to ask me, what's the best book in support of your view, I would say, read, the, read that view for the pre-tribulational rapture, then look up all the verses in context, and you will be post-tribulational instead. <laughs> but, um, uh, sorry, so my, my, my view is coming out rather strongly right now, I, but I mean, it's the way I see it. But um, 
But actually, I can go a little bit longer if you have time, because I, I think people may feel cheated if I don't at least address some of the some of the verses. And then, the, you know, the for the six year olds and the seven year olds, this might be might not be as relevant. But for the um, some of your viewers, they might be saying, "How can you just tell us your view and you don't even defend it?" So yeah. <laughs> um, so some of the some of the arguments used for a rapture before the tribulation. One of the better ones, I think, is Revelation 3.10, which says that, um, this is the church in Philadelphia, because, because you've kept the word of my perseverance, I will also keep you from the hour of testing, which is to come on the face of the earth. But then we have the problems of what keep from means and the problems of the context. First of all, the the phrase keep from, that, that particular Greek phrase appears only one other place in the New Testament in John 17, 15, which is also John speaking, Jesus, uh, sorry, Jesus speaking, John recording, and that is, uh, I pray not that you would take them out of the world, but that you would keep them from the evil one. So it basically means protect from while you're there. Elsewhere in, in Revelation, we don't see people being taken out of the tribulation except by dying for their faith you know we don't see them being caught up to heaven um, and in fact the first resurrection in revelation 20 verses 4 and 5 it's called the first resurrection it's of those who've died for their faith they've been beheaded uh, during during the period of tribulation we don't see any description of jesus coming to revelation chapter 19 some people say, well, yeah, but in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, it says, come up here. Yeah, it says that to John. It's not the only time John is told to come here. He's told to come here in Revelation 17, for example. Uh, they say, well, it's a trumpet speaking with him. That's trumpet speaking with him in chapter 1. I mean, that's John being caught up to heaven to have a vision. It's not the only vision he has in the book of Revelation. It's not the whole church. And then people will say, well, you, you don't have it called the church on earth during the tribulation. We don't have it called the church in heaven either. I mean, it's it's just believers in both places. Um, another another text that's sometimes used for the pre-tribulational view is Second Thessalonians chapter two, where the restrainer of lawlessness must be taken out of the way before the um, man of lawlessness will appear. The question is, what is the restrainer of lawlessness? Is that the church? Is that the Holy Spirit? Um, there are actually like 30 major views <laughs> on what that is. But one thing I think it can't be is the church because the paragraph begins by saying, now concerning the coming of our Lord and our gathering to him. And in, in Greek, it's the same. The phrase is all connected together. So our, our gathering at his coming he says, that won't happen unless this happens first. The man of lawlessness sets himself up on, in, the, in the temple. So the, uh, our gathering doesn't precede that. It follows that. Uh, and, and also in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, starting with verse 5, it talks about believers experiencing tribulation and goes on to say, we'll experience this tribulation until the Lord gives us rest from it when he comes with his mighty angels and flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who don't know God and to those who don't obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus on the day when he comes to be glorified in his saints. Some people say, well, no, you have, um, you have these verses that talk about the Lord can come unexpectedly. Uh, it doesn't really say at any moment, but unexpectedly, like a thief in the night. Yes, but you look all those verses up in context, and the only coming they actually talk about is a coming after the tribulation. If the context tells us anything about the timing, I mean, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse, verses 10 and following, for example, the day of the Lord comes like a thief in the night, in which the heavens pass away with a great noise and the elements melt with fervent heat. Where are you going to have a tribulation? <laughs> it's like this is the end this is not something before the end you can say well he's not he's just not giving us the details there but there's no passage anywhere 
that explicitly says Jesus is coming before the tribulation. Feel free, you know, if people don't believe me, just feel free, look, read through the whole thing, see. But there are plenty of passages that talk about explicitly he's coming at the end and every eye will see him. People say, well, in one he comes to the clouds and the other he comes to the earth. Actually, the ones where he comes to the earth, he comes in the clouds also, you know, so it's not like these are contradictory. In fact, what he says in Matthew 24 and some of the other passages where Jesus talks about his coming, you look in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5, and you look in 2 Thessalonians 2, in, in just like three paragraphs in 1 and 2 Thessalonians, it, it, it says all these things about what Jesus said about his coming. So it's, it's going over the same material. But Jesus, in context, was explicitly talking about his coming after the tribulation. First Thessalonians is explicitly talking about his coming and, and resurrecting the saints and we meet him in the air. And Daniel 12 explicitly places the resurrection at the end of, of the days. So, I mean, it's, it's all over the place. Some people, I actually forgot this. We had to add it in at the very end, just a brief comment because we didn't have much room left, but uh, when we're writing the book, I forgot that people appeal to this, but John chapter 14, um, I'll go and prepare a place for you. I'll, I'll receive you to myself. In context, that's talking about something completely different, but uh, <laughs> it's certainly not talking about a rapture before the tribulation becomes. Um, we, we have a place in the Father's house. Uh, some of these things, there's just too much. And so it, um, probably say, uh, that's what the book is for. But, uh, but again, if you just take the verses, you look them up in context, or you just even better read straight through, you'll see that none of them explicitly talk about it coming before the tribulation. Um, the, tribu the final tribulation is the same kind of thing that believers have been experiencing for a long time. And Jesus coming is a different kind of thing. I mean, everything's gonna be different when Jesus comes. So, uh, yeah, so that's just a brief, a brief summary of um, some, of the, some of the arguments. There's actually a lot more that could be said. But if you don't want to read our book, even better than reading our book is just reading through the New Testament for yourself. If I hadn't been taught either way, and, and honestly, because it's God that we answer to, if I hadn't been taught either way, would I see a difference between the rapture and the second coming? Would I, would I see, you know, this period separating the two? Or would I assume that they both happen at the same time, that there's just one, one return? But I recommend our book too. Um, and how about, um, since the title of your book mentions, you know, free, fear, mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about fear? Like, are sure. we not to be afraid? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus says, don't fear those who kill the body or can't kill your soul. Fear the one who can cast both soul and body into hell. So if we live in light of eternity, we live for Jesus, we die for Jesus. We're gonna die one way or the other until, you know, unless Jesus comes back first. Our, our blessed hope is not that we don't die first. Mm. Our blessed hope is the glorious appearing of our, our God and savior, Jesus Christ, Titus chapter two. Um, that's a hope that isn't relevant just to the last generation. It's been relevant to every generation of Christians. It's been relevant to our loved ones who have gone before us who, who love the Lord. All of us who, who love Jesus, our, our hope is we're going to get to see him. You know, we already have a foretaste of that by the Spirit, but we're going to, we're going to see him fully and be conformed to his likeness fully. And our own, our, our own bodies will be glorified uh, like his glorious body, Philippians chapter 3, uh, verses 20 and 21. Mm -hmm. Our citizenship is in heaven uh, from which 
uh, Jesus will descend and and he'll make our bodies like his body. So, um, yeah, we we don't have to be afraid, no matter what we face. Christians have, all through history, uh, Corey Ten Boom, who holds who held the same view I did, lived through a Nazi prison camp, and her sister died there, but they shared the same hope, the same the same expectation. Jesus is coming back, and it makes it makes it worth everything. And as her sister said before she passed away, there's no pit so deep that God is not deeper still. There were Christians in, in China during the period of, of Mao's uh, purges, the, the Red Guards, uh, and so on. And <clears throat> the, the, the missionaries had been forced out, like, I think in 1949. But some of the missionaries in certain regions had taught the church that they would be raptured out before the tribulation came. And when missionaries came back around 1989, I was actually at a missions headquarters when this report came back that some of the Christians locally, they said, oh, we thought you had been raptured and we had to go through the tribulation by ourselves. You know, we don't actually need your help here. We've been carrying on for Jesus for a while now. Uh, we do want to not give people a false hope. It's not a matter of, of escapism, which is not how the pre-tribulation view started. It started as, as just, you know, Israel, and God doesn't deal with Israel and the church at the same time, which I don't think is true. But, um, but I think what appeals to a lot of people is the idea, oh, we'll, we'll escape. The church hasn't escaped in other generations. It, you know, why would God do something like this just, you know, after like 20, 30 generations, just do it for, you know, final intensity for like three and a half years or seven years. We have the same hope that believers all through history have had, and that is Jesus is coming back. And no matter what we go through, you know, most of us have, have experienced the loss of somebody we love. Most of us have experienced grief somehow, or if we haven't, if the Lord tarries, we will. Uh, and if you know we continue to live, we will. Death still happens until Jesus comes back, but Jesus is coming back, and that's what we live for. Yes, um, I remember there was a time where I was feeling very ill, very weak. Yeah, sometimes when you go through a lot of pain, um, even mental illness, it can yeah. feel, life can feel really difficult. Yes. And I remember feeling comforted during that time, um, knowing that there's this better world, you know, there's, there's when Jesus is coming again, yes. um, that was, that was just something to look forward to, you know, keep our eyes on the future, not on the present. So I think this has been a very um, helpful conversation. Um, we went through many topics that are, I just feel like it, we were able to uh, share with our viewers, like a larger picture of the Bible, you know, because sometimes we don't, I know for me, I, I just don't realize the scope of these things and how relevant they are to what I'm reading in the Bible, you know. Um, so thank you so much for your time today. Did you have anything else to say or can you share where people can go to learn more about you and the things that you do? Yeah. Um, I, I, I should keep up with it better. Um, you're, you're probably a much better, um, you, you, you post regular podcasts, but I, I'm not so good at that. But anyway, um, there's craigkeener.com. Uh, just Craig Keener, all one word. Keener is K-E-E-N-E-R. Um, the Bible background commentary is probably my most generally useful work. And Impossible Love is probably my most readable work. Gift and Giver is, is fairly readable too. Some of my books are mainly for scholars. Um, <clears throat> if you skip the footnotes, you might enjoy them, but... <laughs> um, yeah. And yeah. Um, it, but it's just been a, a real privilege to be with you. And 
your your desire to uh, know Jesus more fully. Uh, someday we'll know him even as we are known, see him face to face. And I just love talking about Jesus, talking about the Bible, and I love sharing with my brothers and sisters. And uh, I'm usually so busy, you know, with a detailed scholarly work. So this has been a good break for me today. So thank okay. you. I'm glad. Thank you so much for being here. God bless. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah, you too. God bless you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.